Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip, the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit MagnaGrip.com. Hey, welcome to the February edition of Fire Ground Strategies and other stuff from the street on Fire Engineering Talk Radio. As usual, Chief Avila and I, we never know what we're going to talk about. We never know where we're going to end up. It's kind of like a firehouse kitchen table. We just talk about whatever comes up to our mind. So tonight, we've kind of got a little head start. We're going to talk a little bit about FDIC and all the people that make it happen. And I don't mean the instructors. Um, I do mean the students, but we're not going to talk about them. We're going to talk a little about some of the volunteers and the uh, casual employees that work at FDIC to make it happen. And then because of Chief Avillo's recent article in Fire Engineering and also this horrible winter around the country, we're going to talk about winter firefighting. And uh, it brings with it a host of other issues. And... uh, I'm going to put a lot of that on the villa, but having been a Northeast firefighter, I have some of my nightmare stories to tell as well. Brian, how about you? You probably have them in Missouri. You have the winter nightmares as we do. No, we never get, we really don't get snow or cold or anything in Missouri. No, we do. We definitely get snow and cold <laughs> ice and everything else like that. And we truly get all four seasons here in Missouri, luckily. So we can uh, I'll definitely be able to discuss that. And some of the Yeah, other- one thing you guys don't do well. I was out there two or three years ago, and I was in Columbia. It's like, my God, don't they plow the streets here? Oh, <laughs> we drive. The, it's fine. This, yeah. Yeah, but this conference was going on, and it was like you had to be going over piles of snow in the middle of the street. It was pretty nuts. It didn't help that Silvanel almost killed us. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. His no, that was crazy. actually the department, not Silvernail. Uh, wow. Well. One of them little rescue trucks came going through an intersection at Mach 1. But we'll leave that alone. <laughs> but anyway, yep. I'll, I'll start a little bit about where I'd like to go. Um, all of us here that are talking today are instructors at FDIC. And what a blessing that is for us and how exciting that is for us. Um, to the students, we're who they see and they come to listen to us. But there are hundreds, literally hundreds of people that make this event happen. Um, first of all, the bosses, you know, David, Diane, um, I can't say enough about them. The students, and I believe they're still from Columbia Southern. Is that right, Brian? I think Eastern Kentucky University. Isn't it? Eastern, Eastern Kentucky. They, they're in fire science programs, and they mm-hmm. come and they monitor the rooms. Uh, they do the introductions. Um They make sure the rooms are set up correctly and things working out. But what they get to do is they get to go to classes. And um, so they're volunteering their time and it's difficult, but they get to see yourself, Brian, Anthony, and all the other instructors because they don't stay, you know, they'll stay in one room, but they get to see all the different instructors over the week. And I think they're getting a great experience. And um, they definitely, I know, they make my life easier. I always stop in the volunteer room to, to thank them um, because they've saved me more than once. The AV guys, oh, my God, they are absolutely incredible. There was a while that FDIC was a little behind the times, like no HDMI hookups mm-hmm. and things like that. But the AV mm-hmm. guys made sure all that stuff works. So I'm grateful mm-hmm. to them. Eileen Brennan, um, you know, what she does, uh, especially with the awards she helps with. Um, all the people there. Rob DeMar, you know, he's a FDNY dispatcher, but he goes out there and he spends time with their uh, Marty mm-hmm. Groove. All these people. Kevin Shea. Uh, Kevin yeah. Shea. He does all the signage, you know, uh, but he doesn't teach class out there. I mean, he teaches all over, but he doesn't typically teach at FDIC. You know, uh, he's very content in who he is and what he does. Um, And Tim Oak, you know, God bless him. Let's uh, keep him in our thoughts. But the photography that he does, uh, there is absolutely incredible. So um, 
you guys who listen to the show and go to FDIC, just take a look at all that's going on and all the people doing the work uh, that makes it come together. And then the vendors. The vendors spend a lot of money and they make this possible for us. So make sure while you're at FDIC, you go visit a few vendors. Um, I don't, don't know what you're looking for. If you're looking for an engine or a truck or just some tools and some rigging. Uh, there are so many vendors there and they make this happen. And they always um, have good candy. They always have good candy. They do. <laughs> Hey, I would also tell everybody that's going to be going to FDIC, make sure you download that app. So FDIC has got an app this year. They had one last year, but a lot of people didn't download it. And uh, they expected to find those paper copies in the halls and things like that of the uh, basically the FDIC guide. Uh, so there will be no printed FDIC guide at 2024. Everything will be on that app. So it'll kind of be lost if you don't do that. So make sure you go out there. It's available now on uh Apple Store or Google Play or all those all those sites that you can get your apps from, but um, download it now, get familiar with it, and then uh, then you'll be ready for the first day of FDIC without any problems. So make sure you do that. Yeah, and one of the other things they said was if you downloaded the app last year, you know, delete it from your device because it's a new app this year. It's a different app. Yeah. So if you have last year's app, it's not going to work on this year's show. So I'm just getting used to all this app stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what's an app yeah but no i just got my uh my pictures too you know the thing they sent out oh, you know, yeah. that you, using you using advertising and stuff yeah I, I i had never got hadn't gotten them yet so i i reached out to diane and she made sure i got them so i threw them on, out on facebook and uh, on our different pages and stuff so um and i'll be doing uh strategic decision making on wednesday morning at Right after the big show, right after the opening ceremonies, which yeah, also you're, is, you're opposite me. You you're doing the same time. Yeah, I got to oh, compete no, wait, with no, you. No, 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 no. Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I'm not doing Wednesday. I'm sorry. I'm doing Monday morning. I'm doing a pre-conference workshop. I'm not doing a classroom session. I'm doing Monday morning pre-conference workshop. At, you're, at, you're killing uh, me, buddy. Sorry, man. <laughs> I mean, you thought this was at, 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 at noon today. Then you thought it was at 5 o'clock today we were recording this. Oh, yeah. I'm, 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 <laughs> I got COVID, man. My head is in a fog. Oh, I'm in it's because three, of so COVID. Right. That's right. That's why I'm quarantined in this little little closet-sized office. I don't think you've moved out of that office in the last three days, it looks like. No, I probably haven't. I did change my shirt, though. Mm. Thank you. I appreciate it. Nice. Yeah. But anyway. Thing on the wall, though. I have a whole bunch of stuff to hang up there. So the next time there'll be some mm -hmm. different things up there. Don't forget, too, you know, when we talk about FDIC, there's all the volunteers and stuff. But also don't forget about those people that run that logistics section to make those hands-on classes work. You know, Brent he Brent's oh heading that God. up now. And, you know, he does a fantastic job of, of doing things and, and, and making sure that all the everything that you need for, for your class is there uh, for the students and the instructors. And then uh, the new online um, QR codes for evaluations and things that are coming, you know, Brent's done a fantastic job with all that stuff uh, and, and, and taking over for, uh, you know, Rhodes who was doing logistics for that stuff. So, you know, we don't, yeah, absolutely. We don't see that on the back end, but it's, it's definitely progressing forward. So it's, it's still, you know, those guys are doing fantastic. Mm. Let me ask you yeah, a question about that. that a long time. Go ahead, Dave, Go ahead. Dave, Dave, Dave's done it forever. Um, will there be paper evaluations in the rooms or will it have to be done through that app? Yeah, it'll be a QR thing. I think they're going to scan it. The, I don't think the students have to have the app necessarily, but uh, but they'll have to complete the evaluations and uh, to get you know the credit and all that stuff. And uh, so it'll be good. I think it'll and it'll give us as the instructors, which is what you know FTSC is about, is bring quality training and education to the students. Um, it'll give us, you know, good feedback uh, that, you know, we can actually take and, and kind of quantitate and uh, make a better, better instructor and a better FDIC for years to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. hundred percent. I read every evaluation and I take pictures of the best and the worst. All the anything that offers some constructive criticism, I take the pictures. And, I, and whether I'm teaching at FDIC or anywhere else, I take that to heart. Um, I missed something, you know, uh, maybe something that a Royal Fire Department does or something that a city fire department does that I didn't talk about. Um, 
if it fits, I'll put it in my future program. So yes, absolutely, students, we read those evaluations. So do the bosses at FDIC. <laughs> they, they read them all. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you didn't like something somebody said or an attitude or you did really like something, make sure you write it down. Just don't fill in the check boxes. Say, hey, I loved when he spoke about X, Y, Z, or I loved when she talked about this. It, it, it's really important. They need to know. And that's how you get a really good program at FDIC every year. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, Chief of Villa, um, yeah. I want to talk about your article. I'm going to leave most of this to you, but I'm going to have some input, and I'm sure Brian's going to have some input. By the way, our new president. Hmm. Brian, why don't you give a little bit of your uh, yeah, let's, bio let's before talk we about move Brian on. first. Uh, Brian yeah. came to us today. Um, we, we saw him selling pencils on the corner, and uh, we said, let's let's get this guy in here so that they don't pay him enough, and here he is. That is that is one hundred percent fact. No, uh, no, I'll be taking over. Uh, very excited to be taking over the uh, reins at uh, the International Society of Fire Service Instructors. Um, be taking over as president at FDIC this year for a two year term, and so uh, we have a lot of really exciting things going on with the Instructor Society. Um, I know a lot of people may not know about it yet, or they've heard it, or they've seen it at FDIC, and they're really not sure. Does it fit me? Or well, I'm not the training guy at my department, so it doesn't relate to me, but. You know, I always tell everybody that if you're an instructor or a company officer or even the training officer, for that matter, you definitely got to be in there. But if you're looking to just better your game, the ISFSI is where it's at. Um, you know, if you're the company officer looking for how to, you know, a, a, how to do a company drill or whatever. You know, I looked online the other day at our members forum and there's 169 different skill drills, instructor grams that you can just print off and take with you. Um, if you're a training officer, you know, you have the building of the training grounds by, you know, Chief Dryman of, of Indianapolis, who has an incredible training grounds if anybody's been out there lately. Um, it's an incredible facility. So all these are available to our members. And, you know, it's just a I just think people just don't realize what what the opportunities are there um, from the training programs that we have, uh, the online component of it, webinars that are offered from everything from shipboard firefighting. Um, which I know nothing about and really don't have it in my future um, to how to be a better instructor to stuff like you guys are talking about, you know, everything in between. And, and so those are, you know, available to us as, as members uh, from our members. Mm -hmm. And so it, it kind of, you know, the thing I say the FDI or ISFSI does is it, it, you know, we're all where we're at, you know, and I'll, I don't want to speak for you two gentlemen, but you know, when I got started in the fire service, never in a million years that I think I would ever be teaching or standing on a stage or, do anything that I'm doing now. Um, it's only because of opportunities and doors that were open. And I say that ISOSI can assist in opening those doors and opportunities for those members that want to go different places in their career. So that's what we do, you know, and, and as a president, you know, uh, Anthony's heard me say this before I got the three R's. I want to maintain relevancy for the ISOSI and the fire service, build relationships with those that can help us advance the fire service and recruit additional members to strengthen our mission. So, that's my uh, that's my goal over the next three years to do those three things and uh, make it better than I found it. Super. How many how many people are in that organization now? How many members we got there? Well, there's only one voted for me uh, for president. So I'm no, I think we're around two thousand members, uh, two thousand members yeah. strong. Yeah. So I mean, that's that, good. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's a you know it's it's not a huge organization, but. Um, but our members are engaged and involved. You know, we got members all over the yeah. all over the world. Uh, we got the you know the fire chief of the Kenyan Airport is a member. Um, mm. We got members in Europe and Asia. We got members. Uh, obviously, uh, most of our members are reside here in the United States, um, just like all the most of the big organizations. But um, we got members in Canada and all over. So you know, we really do represent an international environment and really try to to strive to meet their needs and uh, share as much as we can so that. We truly are bettering the International Fire Service as much as we can. You know, when you think about the 30,000 people come to the FDIC, you know, if we just got 10% of those people to sign up to the ISFSI, oh. that, would, that would be a home run, you know. Um, there are so many resources there. And, and as you said earlier, the forum, like a, like a bulletin board where, you know, you're looking for a, an SOP, you're looking for a, a training uh, lesson plan, you're looking to – you know, sort of set up your training program. It, it's all there. And, and all you got to do is ask. I remember um, 
there, there was the, uh, uh, the community bulletin board with fire engineering for a while. And it, it did the same thing. And, uh, you know, uh, Everybody looks, I look at it every day and you try and, and, uh, and accommodate people what they want. And, and you know, you, you're, you're not sure of something on your, in your fire department. You ask somebody at the ISFSI will be able to tell you. And, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to work on the Brian. I'm the region three director. Um, he pulled me in, dragged me in and uh, I'm learning every day as I go. Great people doing it. Great people uh, involved in it. And uh um, you know, you, you should get involved in it. It's a, it's, it's a really cool thing. And, um, and the networking part of it is, it's oh, just the FBI networking yeah. part of it is great. Really oh, yes. Nice. You know, in from a financial aspect of it, not to get dollars and cents on everybody, but you know, the membership fee annually, it, you know, if you look at that, what it costs, and then you look at your registration for FDIC, you know, if you're a member of ISFSI, you get 10% off your FDIC registration. So it essentially pays for itself if you go to FDIC. And to your point of 30,000 people going up to FDIC, you know, if we could get 10% of those to come in and say, hey, you know what, I could get a discount of 10% off my registration and become an ISFSI member and seek all the benefits that are there with ISFSI plus getting that 10% would be a home run. So uh, mm. I encourage everybody to take a look at it, ISFSI.org, real simple website. Reach out to me. I'm on social media. I'm on, you know, all the stuff and, and emails, my first and last name at Gmail. So couldn't be much simpler than that, right? So reach out to me if you got questions about ISFSI stuff. But no, it's always good to talk to you fellas. And I look forward to uh, discussing some winter fire ground strategy and tactics. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. This country is huge. We have all kinds of weather. Um, I remember complaining because I taught in Houston in June and also in Baton Rouge in June. I was like, how do these people do it? And I wonder how they even put on turnout gear down there. But then I think of what we have to face up here in the Northeast and the middle of the country, uh, the weather. But Chief Bill just wrote an awesome article uh, about things you have to be concerned about. It's another battlefront that we have to deal with in the northern climb. So Chief Bill, tell us what brought you to write that article and then give us some ideas, some headlines from it. Well, I was, I was, oh, here it is. I was saying, I was looking around for the copy to see what the hell I wrote. Um, well, <laughs> you know, uh, every, every now and then this, and, and this was my 38th article, man. It's a, it's a lot. And I'm going, my FDC, the FDIC, this be my 25th year. So when the hell did we get so old, man? I, I, you know? Um, I don't want to hear it. I know. I know. You know, it's, uh, it, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I just had, you know what, I, I do articles on notes, you know, I start notes, you know, and I have little notes and I have them on my phone and then I'll add to them and add to them. And, and you know, you want to write an article, that's how you write an article. You know, um, there was a, a, a girl, 15 year old girl at the, the Count Basie theater where I was, was working and uh, she's looking to write a novel and she was in this storytellers thing. And, uh, you know, I grabbed her after that and I said, uh, you know, it's great that you're writing a book, you know, and I said, do you know how you write a book? She said, no, I don't. I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. I said, you write a book one page at a time. And when you can't write one page, you write a paragraph. And when you can't write a paragraph, you write a sentence. It's just an idea. And then things blossom from there, you know, and, and, and that's kind of how I do with a lot of my articles. You know, I'll, I'll like I may have might have written down. Well, in fact, for this one, I just wrote, you know cold weather stuff. And then I, from there, I just started listing things that, you know, I would, I would like to talk about, you know, um, it's, you know, it's, it, uh, as everything, it starts with the organization, you know, um, if the organization doesn't have a cold weather plan, then all of the equipment that you need for it, uh, is, is not going to be there when you need it. And the day of the storm is not the day to scramble around to, to try and secure that equipment. You know, we, we don't get a ton of snow, uh, up in up in New Jersey, up in North Jersey, we don't. We get you know we'll get ice and things like that, and uh, you know not ice like Vermont and places like that, and not snow like you know, uh, you know places that are you know are are snowy, <laughs> for lack of a better term. But uh, we had put a plan in place, and I, I think it was it might have been Chief McElhenney, but as as always, it was probably Chief Flood, and he said, you know, we need to have a plan here. For, you know, when something happens that uh, we don't want to be caught off guard, you know, and, and serving five cities, 
there's a, it, there's a little bit more of a reach out there where you have to uh, involve the, the city um, and for in our case, five of them in, in, in the support of your winter, your winter plan, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's salting, there's, there's, uh, clearing the, uh, uh, clearing the aprons. There is, uh, you know, making sure generators are working. Um, uh, but, but having all that in place and, and that's kind of what it was. I remember in, in our, our, our policy and, and it's interesting because I couldn't find it. Um, it was like, this is what you do in, in September. This is what we do in October. This is what we do in November. So it, it kind of starts in September for, for the, uh, for the cold weather months, you know, and a lot of it has to do just with the equipment, you know, um, and, uh, and the preparation in the firehouses, you know, um, you know, going to be and down at headquarters, you're thinking about, you know, overtime and you're thinking about, um, do we have enough bunks for everybody? You're thinking about, do we have enough radios for everybody? Um, you know, and, and by us, it's, uh, and I'm not sure if it was this way with you guys, and if I remember correctly, the offgoing shift is always the one that shovels in the morning when the ongoing shift is coming on, right? So if my shift is on duty and the guys are coming in at 7.30, by like 6.30, my guys will be out there clearing everything. And then when the new shift comes on, they, they you know, have, they, they got a fresh start so to speak, you know, um, but, you know, uh, and it's not even that, it's, it's the apparatus too. You make sure you have enough salt on the apparatus and that sort of thing. And, uh, um, and then it's the driving and everything else, you know, um, making sure that the, uh, the, the heat works on all the rigs, you know, years ago, I'm sure you remember Duff and, and I'm not sure about you, Brian, uh, how long you've been on the job, Brian? 23 years. Okay, I so wasn't I wasn't around when you guys were feeding horses and stuff though, so I don't know. I don't remember those days of keeping the straw dry and warm and making sure the horses don't yeah, freeze. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you ever um, have to put chains on the rigs? Yes. Well, that was one thing. The chains now that now the chains just dropped down. I remember we used to have to put the chains on. You have to put the rig on these like uh, ramps and put the chains on. Yep. Um, and and then sometimes they would had turnbuckles on them. If sometimes they would. Uh, you know, you lost the chains and, you know, somebody bring them back to the firehouse, you know? Um, well, they get uh, wrapped you, around the axle. Yeah. Yeah. But, but even things like, like uh, make a plan for de-icing, you know, um, you know, some things you can de-ice, uh, you know, like hose couplings and things like that. But what do you do when you get an aerial frozen that's up in the air? Then what do you do? You know, I mean, you, you got a rig out of service. You now have to put a spare rig in service or, or use mutual aid. And uh, you got to get the rig de ice. I remember one time we had to chop a rig out of a block. You know, we, I mean, it, it, that's how frozen it was. It was, it was, I think they lost something like 16 buildings in Union City on a really, really cold night. It just fire just wrapped around the block and there were all carriage houses behind it. Everything was lighting off. And I remember the next day, our telesquirt, we had to, uh, we had to chop it out of the ice, you know, but, but I, th I think that, uh, you know, like anything else, if you're not preparing for what you're doing um, and, and, you know, just to look at the article, it, it covered four things, you know, like the firehouse apparatus, equipment and personnel. And then of course there's first aid, like, the, you know, there's, there's a psychological aspects of, of cold weather firefighting and there's the injury aspect of cold weather firefighting, which is not as dif different than hot weather firefighting because people that, um, start to suffer like hypothermia and things like that as compared to, you know, in the summer, they're usually the last ones to know. So you have to, in North Hudson, that's one of the things we did. We did training in the spring for, for warm weather firefighting and training in the fall for cold weather firefighting, you know, recognizing the symptoms of, of things that might, you know, where, where somebody is, is uh, you know, falling victim of a cold or, or hot heat related injury, you know, um, so, you know, those, those kinds of things, uh, you know, and, uh, and I'm sure you guys have uh, stories like that as well. And, and did you see the video of that rig? And I, I was it in St. Louis, maybe Brian, oh, that yeah. rig it, out of control? was that St. Louis? That was, uh, yeah. Suburb of St. Louis. Yeah. 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 I mean, like, you know, this is real stuff and, 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 you know, you, you have an apparatus that goes out of control, man. That's, that's serious business, man. You know? So, Go ahead, Duff. I'm sure you have plenty to talk about. Yeah, well, you know what? One of the things I want to say that you, you talked about uh, was um, personnel. 
Mm -hmm. You have to be prepared for second alarm sooner in extreme cold weather and extreme hot weather. Um, the guys are shot. You guys do a couple cycles, you know, and I know in some of the big cities, you never see them put on a second bottle. But the guy's been through two cylinders at a fire. They're frozen or they're overheated. And you have to have resources. Like you always said, if you're standing out front and there's nobody standing behind you in colder weather, it's even worse. It's going to take them longer to get there because of the ice on the roads. Hydrants freeze. Um, you might have to get a snow plow to clear the road, not just your aprons, but get you to the scene. And North Hudson's different than where I work. We had one city, one public works department. We would have snow plows run in front of us when we got into blizzards and ice storms, and they would clear the road to get us to scenes. Um, one, one winter, we, you and I were out in Nebraska. We had that giant snowstorm here. It was like 26 inches. Um, and we had the National Guard. We had 40 National Guard people there. They would shovel to get us our lines to the houses. So they would dig so we could stretch lines into fires. You know, those are the kind of things you don't plan on. You never thought of. Um, but our chief called the governor and said, can we get some help in here? And the National Guard was spread all over the state. Uh, to take care of those problems. And we needed them for two working fires that night in the storm. And they literally shoveled so we could stretch our lines. It, it was absolutely amazing. But getting the public works department to plow the roads, because you know 40 square miles of roads that they have to plow and do it in cycles. Um, if you get a call far from the firehouses, all the roads aren't plowed and they go out in front of us. And that was something we always planned on. And the aprons every couple of hours during a bad snowstorm. Pump operators, that's something we got to watch too. I've never seen an engine that doesn't leak. How about you, Brian? No, they all do. They all dreep. So every place that pump operator and the guys are walking, it's an ice skating rink. Whether there's snow or not, it gets cold. And um, I'm going to share one more story. Um something that happened to us that I never even imagined. It was another deep snowstorm. It was over a foot and it was a, in a trailer park. So it was just a single trailer burning, but still it's a over a foot of snow to stretch a line into a driveway, into a trailer park. So there were guys inside the trailer fighting a fire and a snow plow came by and ripped a five inch hose out of the side of the engine that was supplying those attack lines, ripped the gate out, took out the knees of the pump operator, both of them. He ended up going to the hospital. There was a pump attached to the hand lines. But again, thank God it was a trailer. For people to bail out of a trailer was very quick, you know, probably within a minute when they lost water, they bailed out. But we had to get another pump in to replace it. And I never would have imagined that we would lose a supply line due mm. to snowplow. Mm. That's correct. Yeah. You know, and it's i'll never forget i was still a firefighter at this time I'll, i will never forget that like my eyes were bugging out of my head mm. you know um crazy yeah, stuff yeah. you have to be you know aware of of what's happening around you especially as the ice starts to accumulate you know and it's on the fire ground you know you know the adrenaline is going and everything else and then once the adrenaline stops it's uh that's when people start to get cold you know and uh, my my fingertips still burn when it gets cold you know but we've had you know you gotta gotta have salt gotta put salt down that's a pump operator responsibility also and and uh we had an incident where we had two firefighters break their leg in the same place one was during operations at a nighttime fire slipped on the ice broke his leg the next morning my shift was coming in and the fire was you know it was over but we were you know, picking up all the equipment and my rescue captain helping to pick up, pick up equipment. He slipped on the ice in the same spot and broke his leg. So we had two guys with broken legs. We we've since gotten the cleats, uh, the ice cleats um, that they carry them on a safety officer's rig. Um, I've never, I never had the opportunity to use them, but they're like almost like crampons that, uh, that they use to, to, uh, to climb with. And uh, I, I think that's uh that's a good thing. And again, if guys use them, you know, um, I used mine yesterday in the woods. Did you? 
Yeah. Yeah. But you know, again, you know, again, like a one alarm fire becomes a three alarm fire. You always have to be thinking ahead of that of that incident so you can give people um, relief. You know, um, what do you guys do for cold weather over there, Brian? Well, as you know, where I work with the uh, with our great chief, it never gets it never gets below eighty just because of his personality. Oh! Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. His, his sunny personality. Yeah, just his personality. Where is he in the other room? Yeah, no, no. He's probably in his office working. That's all he ever does. I got to talk nice. He's picking me up tomorrow. Nice. No, so, you know, I, I, I reiterate what you guys are saying. I, I can't say it enough is, you know, you have to have a plan. You have to look at this stuff and be prepared. Um, you know, some of the things we do is, you know, we try to reduce the, the runs for the big trucks. Um, so we have a few four wheel drive vehicles, a, a small brush truck, a mini pumper type uh, F550 truck. And so try to get those on the roads more, utilize our battalion chief and stuff like that in a, in a Tahoe type vehicle, um, just for the profile aspect of it, you know, going on the EMS calls and the routine runs and try to keep those bigger trucks off the roads unless absolutely necessary. Um, we have a plow, we're getting another plow next year. So we'll have two for the fire department plus our public works, of course, and calling those people in. But I think to your guys' point, you know, it's a lot of situational awareness. And then, you know, the one thing that I think we could do better of is the um, this the community awareness part of it, right? Like, um, we don't get giant snows in Missouri. You know, we might get a foot, and that would be crazy for us. But like, you look at some of the northern places. I mean, they could. It's easy to bury a hydrant, and even in our six and seven inch snows that we get, you know, with the plows. To your point, ripping a, a thing out, we can get a plow and push a pile up on a hydrant. We'll you know, on our map, we show a hydrant, but man, where's it at? And, you know, this pile. So just making the community aware, hey, listen, if you got a hydrant around your house, please try to dig it out or, or help us out so that if we have a fire, we can get to it and things like that. Um, and then, you know, our biggest thing too is just the staffing. You know what, you know, we, I always tell them it's second alarm season when it gets cold and things like that. But, you know, what was a routine emergency of a, a person fell, right? So somebody falls outside and all of a sudden we're like, well, that's just one ambulance, right? Two people. Well, how easy is it to study a uh, stretcher with two people in cold weather on ice or snow, right? And the last thing you want to do is have one of your people fall or the patient tip over, something catastrophic happens. So, you know, extra people is always good. And so knowing that situational awareness and, and having those trigger points in place, um, you know, I've worked at organizations, not my current organization, but um, where every time it snows, it was like the first time it ever snowed. Like, what are we going to do this time? Like, oh, hey. We should do X, Y, and Z. And then next time we'll do A, B, and C. And the next time we'll do, you know, whatever. And so, you know, having to your point, a plan that says, hey, listen, you know, I actually wrote a paper on that through the EFO program on, on you know, what trigger points require what, right? So that you weren't like, well, hey, I, you know, should we do something? Should we not do something? Uh, no, here's the trigger points. If it's this, we should do these things. If it's this, we should definitely do these things. And that way you kind of had a standardized response. That could always be augmented, of course, but um, at least she gave you a framework, uh, to, to make yourself set up for success. Hmm. Yeah. And do you guys yeah. have your own transport units or that's a private ambulance company? No, we do our own. Yeah. You do your own. So there's another thing, you know, putting on extra ambulances, um, that storm I was talking about where we, we lost the uh, supply line, that same storm, uh, we lost a, a patient in the driveway because we couldn't get an ambulance out to them. You know, having uh, extra ambulances stationed in different places might help, depending on how your district's set up. Um, you may not get the ambulance closer to where the incident is or um, things like that, um, like the, uh, the emergency response organization within your town. Maybe you can put stand some people there, an extra engine or an extra ambulance because of the travel times. Um, can more than double sometimes. I mean, sometimes, it, like you talked about hydrants, we shovel hydrants. I know it's been a big whining factor among the members, um, but we would go out and shovel the hydrants. And, um, you know, you're killing them. You know, you spend three hours outside just digging out hydrants, not responding to calls. It's difficult. And it's not really good for the morale. You know, oh, why are we doing this? Well, the water department should be doing well. You know what? We should be doing it because we're the ones that are going to need it. You know, it's not fun. Um, but your message to the public to dig them, if there's a hydrant 
near your property, it's only going to help you. If it takes four minutes to make a hydrant or one minute to make a hydrant, it's going to make a huge difference. Um, mm -hmm. We carry um, 750 gallons of water on our hydrants, uh, on our engines, because we have a lot of hydrants in most of the town. But in some rural areas, the water they have until they set up some kind of water supply, that's all they have. You know, and you guys use a lot of quints out in your area, correct, Brian? Uh, we yeah, we got some. I mean, not not a tremendous amount, but yeah, we have a few. Yeah, I know your area is big on right. Quint. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. use they usually have smaller yep booster tanks, tanks too. You know, five hundred mm -hmm. gallons of water or mm -hmm. less sometimes. Yep. You know, so that's kind of scary. You know, in a, I live in a rural area. Their engines all have a thousand gallons of water in it. You know, and then there's a tanker right behind that with 2,000 gallons of water. Um, not where I work, but where I live. You know, um, there's one hydrant in town that's in front of the firehouse. You know, it's where they fill their equipment. But it's from a well anyway. You know, so uh, those are the kind of things. Water supply in rural districts, in the snow, in the ice, dumping tanks. Dangerous place for firefighters. I also think, too, is that, you know, if you're the safety officer on those calls, you know, you know, sometimes we get so in, involved in the fire aspect of it as an incident commander or a division chief or even operations or something like that, that that safety officer is really that person that could take a step back and say, hold on, time out. Like, I got to get a crew. You know, it sounds ridiculous, but I got to get a crew to put some salt down before I lose a crew. Right. So, like, you know, think about those things. If you're that, you know, we're putting people up on the roof. What's that going to be like? You know, it's already dangerous to get on a roof. Now we're getting on a roof that's, you know, slick and snow covered, or ice covered, things like that. And we all know firefighters. If I tell somebody to get to the roof, man, the first thing you're going to do is jump on a ladder and get up there. They're not thinking, you know, because that's what we do. And so I, th I think in those cold weather situations, if you're finding yourself as a safety officer, you know, take a, a step back and look at the big picture of this fire, you know, where it's going, how many people are going to need to be here. And then, you know, I'll ask you guys too, you know, one of the problems we sometimes face is, you know, if I get 30 guys on a scene, they come out of a fire and it's five degrees outside. Where am I putting them to warm them up before I put them back in, you know, in a rehab, right? So, you know, sometimes you can get a bus if you're lucky. Uh, but, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what you guys are, what your, what your thoughts on that are or options, you know? Well, we had a bus um, in North Hudson. We had a bus, uh, but... Um, that was for our people. Although sometimes we put civilians on it. Other times we would just, uh, you know, hijack a building. We had a, uh, a water main break one time and uh, the street that it was on was sort of, it was sort of a concave street and uh, they were rescuing people out of basements, you know, like, like people, you know, like Moses taking them out of the water. And uh, we, it was cold, it was freezing about eight degrees out. And we had nowhere to put anybody. So there was a quick check on the corner and we just started putting people inside the quick check. The owner really didn't didn't like that. But you know what? What, what else are you going to do? You're talking about, you know, um, people uh, that uh, you know they, they may not last out there for too long. You know, we're wearing all our gear and, and people coming out of a building that's you know got smoke in it or whatever. And we had this happen too. Um, you know, granny in her nightgown and, and babies and all that. Um, that was one time where we actually did. We, we hijacked the bus. We uh, had people out in the street, and I didn't have any way to get them anywhere. And, you know, nobody's opening their doors in North Hudson, you know. And uh, the cop had told me there was a, a community center a couple of blocks away, and uh, but he didn't have a key to it, and I didn't have anybody to liberate the locks. So I said, go, you know, go down the next block and stop a bus and, and you know, bring it here, you know, and. You know, luckily it was the middle of the night, so the bus was pretty much empty. But they, you know, bring the bus here, and we put the people on the bus. You know, I had to an answer for it the next day, but uh, you know, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> oh, well, any, yeah, any different, you know. Um, Sorry, you have to do. Yeah, have to do, and sometimes you got to be creative, right? Yep. Community centers and senior centers w was our mm -hmm. first plan, but mm -hmm. they're not, not always close, so you got to get a bus. But the senior centers have little mini buses. Yeah. So we try to get them to senior center. But if it's a big enough incident, we had one where it was a multi-story building. It was a double fatal fire. No, it was a single fatal fire. It doesn't matter, but a lot of elderly people. After the senior center, it's a school. You got to get somebody to open the schools. And that becomes, mm -hmm. but that's all, all of that takes time. 
the senior yeah. center, at least we had it linked into somebody there. We could get it open quickly and we could get a driver for the bus. Mm-hmm. And that's that part of your well. winter plan. Yeah, it's part, it's of, part of the plan. plan. You know, you know, what are you going to do with the people? You know, so you have to have access to the the board of education or access to to the key holders for those places. You know, through your dispatch. Absolutely, you know, these, these things that you have to do. You know, and uh, you know, and and you know, you talked about um, the uh, the hidden, you know, the hidden dangers. You know, things like like you know, or or the again, situational awareness. You know, ice on the power lines, ice on on fire escapes, right? Ice on ladders. Um, these are other things that, you know, you go up on a roof. There was no ice on that ladder when you got on the roof. But now you're coming back down that, that from that roof and it, then the ladder is full of ice. You know, what, what do you do? How do you de-ice that ladder? Or you got to now have somebody raise another ladder. You know, there was a, an incident um, in Connecticut, I believe, where there was – it was a parking garage or something and it was – there was a fire in a parking garage, and, and a guy was walking on the roof, and he stepped right into a skylight. It was snow covered. He went right through, right into the skylight, and uh, you know he was uh, he got hurt really, really bad. Um, and I believe there was another one. I, I it might have been uh, out west somewhere where the same thing happened. Guy was on the roof, and he fell through a skylight. You know, just because it was covered with snow. You know, so you got to watch your steps. You know, you got to. Uh, visibility is going to be poor no matter what you do in those in those nights, and uh, you know, and the apparatus is uh, is going to have a hard time getting places. You know, our streets are narrow enough, and then add in the hills in North Bergen, yeah, right, the hills that are like this. You know, they're, they're God, you know, forty five degree hills, you know, and maybe more, and uh, you know, trying to get the rigs down those blocks and 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 have to operate on those blocks is is you know requires you to to you know, think a little bit, you know, always turn your wheels in, you know, so if the, if the rig starts to slide, it slides into towards the curb and not straight down the block, you know, be careful about being right in front of the rig on a hill because you don't know, you know, the ice may cause that rig to slide, right? I know you don't know anything about this, but we have these things near us. We call them trees. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> the ice forms on the branches and they fall off and they're in the roads. Um, when we get mm-hmm. these nor'easters with the ice storms, uh, it can be a nightmare. It's not snow, but it's literally coming down as liquid and freezing on the limbs and on the streets. And we lose a lot of trees and we lose get these through the roofs, not involved in fire. Um, but you know what a tree is, right, Anthony? I've heard, yeah. Yeah. But we the just, trees. We just had, that. We just had the trees uh, here in St. Louis. We had a little ice storm, uh, you know. Yeah, well, I, we saw that ladder truck. Yeah, well, yeah. So that, but here, you know, in our town, we, we had a couple of trees fall on, on power lines and breaks the power lines down. And, you know, to your point, I mean, that's that's a very dangerous situation. You know, those, those lines are down, everything's wet, right? So what's conducting, what's not conducting. And, uh, you know, so we, you know, we, I know of one, we went on that, you know, we started popping and arcing in the backyard and, you know, crews are starting to walk up and stuff like that and just kind of seeing what was going on and, and things. And I'm just like, you know, you just have to have that situational awareness because, you know, metal fences, where's this line at, uh, where did it drop to you? What's, what's conducting and what's not conducting. And, and, you know, that's mm-hmm. a lights out situation. You know, you touch one of those. How yeah. long does it take for you for your utility companies to get to a scene? Like you're at a fire and you need someone to take control of that electrical problem. How long is a typical response? For us, it, it's we're yeah. pretty quick. We have our own electric company, so we're pretty fortunate. Yeah, so, so do we. That's yeah, what I was so, going to say. We're, yeah, we're about 30 minutes, you know, 30 minutes yeah. within an hour at, at, at the worst case scenario that we'll have somebody on scene and, and assisting us with, you know, the lines and that sort of stuff. Part of our town's covered by a different electric company, but for the majority of us, you know, and they're great to work with, um, you know, help us out. And, and, you know, we call them out and ask them a question or something like that. They're more than willing to, you know, even if it was something they couldn't fix for us, we're like, Hey, we don't know what to do here. Uh, power lines down, even if it's somebody else's, they're like, Hey, we'll get, we'll take care of it and make sure you guys are safe. So very fortunate in that regard. Yeah. There's nothing like having your own, where I live, it's Eversource, which co- covers three quarters of the state. Yeah. You know, it's a big, big, big company. But where I work, they had their own electric division. And I'll have a supervisor at any incident within 10 minutes. We'll have a supervisor there because they have somebody on call 24 7. You know, and sometimes he can just do a quick thing 
as is, but usually he calls a crew in to do with it. Mm-hmm. Um, or she, we now have uh, she doing that as well. And which is pretty cool, but they get right out there and we know what we can and can't do right away. And they can even sometimes remotely shut down large areas. Um, you know, if we got a big enough fire. So having your own utility companies, I've been here where I live sometimes three or four days with no power. I have a little generator. Nah, you know what? I have a generator. I can get my water. I can get my furnace going. I'm okay with it. You there you know? go. Up in the boondocks. There you go. Yep. I wouldn't so, trade it for anything. Well, here's a picture. I'm going to put it right there. See the tree? There's a tree. There's one I see. Is that your town? Tree. See the tree right there? All right. There's at least one tree. Did you, okay? did you say tree or did you say one, two, tree? I can't. I can't tell the Jersey no accent. Tree. There's no tree in that picture, though. <laughs> that looks like an aerial ladder. That doesn't look like a tree. What? Right there. There's a tree. <laughs> to the, nice. to the, see that all the way back there, right over. No, other side. Everything's opposite over here. I don't know. Yes. Anyway, there's a tree there. <laughs> um, I know that's not Union City. It is Union City. <laughs> is it? It is Union I City. Think, I thought only in the parks were the trees allowed there. No, I'm only, no, kid, I'm no, only no. kidding. That was um, that was a bond burner that night, boy. Oh my God, we had a had a four alarm fire fatal in one building, and it was so windy that the uh, the it was windy, it was freezing, and the uh, the embers ignited a church steeple four blocks away. Wow, three about three blocks away, and the church steeple collapsed. That was the aftermath of what was in front of the church steeple. Um, and you know, so cold, of course, everything's just icing up all over the place, you know, um, that's another thing too. You know, you talk about, you know, what do you do once the incident's over? Because nobody wants to stay and pick up the toys, you know, um, everybody wants to get the hell out of there. You got lots of stuff left and, 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 you know, you have fire watch, um, all that stuff, you know, and, and now that requires a plan. You know, you talk about hydrant details. We would do that in the morning or when we thought we needed hydrant details to go. We would do that in the morning, and, and I'd send it over to fire control, our dispatcher, and they would announce it, okay? Uh, you know, engine three, you have uh, fire control detail uh, from this area on this time. And a half hour out, they would they would let them know, engine three, be advised in, uh, you know, well, 15 minutes, uh, you're on hydrant detail. And they'd go out, and another engine would come back, you know? Um, but fire watch, that's another thing, you know? What, what do you do during fire watch? I've been out during fire watch in, in unbelievably cold weather, you know, and uh, um, as a deputy, actually, one time I got recalled and, and the chief who recalled me said, oh, you're making big money. You go out on a fire watch with the guys. He's like, he's <laughs> a prick. Um, but uh, yeah, it was really, really cold. And, uh, you know, when you got rigs that are frozen into the blocks and everything else yep. and, uh, you know. Listen, it, it, it's about the safety of personnel too, you know. So you gotta, you gotta figure that out as well. Maybe you gotta double up your fire watch so that while while some companies are outside like watching the building, other companies are in the rigs, and then you flip flop them every ten minutes or so. You know, that's another thing to do. But again, a lot of departments don't have that staffing to do that. You know, absolutely. Um, but but it has to, there has to be plans. You know, the worst plan is no plan at all, and 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 you know that's where. Um, we, we kind of found all that out and we figured it out over time. You know, look, this worked good last time. This worked good the time before, you know. So let's let's put this in place as, as far as, you know, how we're going to continue, you know, work this fire watch and how we're going to rotate companies through, you know. Um, it, it You know, maybe you, you're keeping your recall personnel for a while, you know. You're keeping your mutual aid in the city for a while while the companies thaw themselves out, get their rig back in service, you know, change their clothes, you know. And that's another thing too, right? Do your guys have uh, cold weather bags? You know, that was one thing we always, you know, wanted people to have. Look, get yourself a cold weather bag where you got extra clothes, extra gloves, extra socks, you know, all that stuff and put it on a rig. But you never do that until what happens? In cold and wet. Till you get caught. Yeah, get out of here, old man. You never do it till you're cold and wet, you know, and once you're cold yep. and wet, you get caught. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you never don't do it again. In the wintertime, I always made sure I at least had extra gloves, man, because I my hands. Got to do it. Cold. Yeah, yeah. Socks, too, big deal. You know, big Have you ever had to put, 
What's that? Bye, Brian. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, some of those silly things like creature comforts, you know, if you can get to your guys and somehow get coffee on a scene or something like that, man, that goes a million miles with the crew that's been working. It's cold yeah. in the morning. You know, I mean, that's the yeah. little things that can make, make you a hero. As a leader, you better be doing that. Yeah. If mm-hmm. you're not taking care of them at cold weather incidents and hot weather incidents, bring them hot coffee. Um, you Did know, you even, guys have canteen units? We did not. We got um, one now. Yeah, we got we got two in our region that are like up there. It's actually kind of cool. It's a it's a group that's set up and they uh, it's made up of a lot of volunteer like old uh, retired firefighters that come out to the scenes like you know and they uh, nice. yeah so you know but they're an hour out and typically but uh, yeah we're okay. there. yeah we use the Jersey City Gong Club. You know, we just have all the time. And, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe North Hudson helps subsidize them or something. But Jersey City Gong Club, you know, a lot of them are, are, are retired guys. But there's other guys that are there that's just what they do, yeah. you know. Yeah, the Bucks. They come out to the jobs. And yeah. TNEC has Box 54, which is another one, which isn't far from us. And then we got our bus, you know, um, which is – there's the bus right there. So did you guys get that donated from like uh, your your bus, like your uh, your transportation? No, we had to buy it for five bucks. Oh, okay, okay. But and I mean, essentially, what they did was they they ripped out all the seats. Yeah. And they put they put benches in along the walls. They also put awnings on it, misters, things like that, like for hot weather. But uh, you know, had that. Buy, I don't think they have it anymore. But I I think they have something else now. I'm not sure, but. You know, it was always a good idea. You know, yeah. okay? we called the rack unit re- re- rehab and care. You know, and that would be, you know, be, you know, I would say on a cold night, look, if I say work and fly, I get the rack unit moving, and because they'd have to call in people from the shops to uh, to uh, operate the rack unit. You know, and you know, they'd Great be there idea. With, with the plows and the and the and the generators and you know, just spreading salt salt spreaders. You know. They would. Uh, they were very good. Our, our shops were very, very good. Uh, that's, that's great. One thing I have to say, you know, yeah. yeah have you ever had a pickup hose on a flatbed? Oh yeah, throw it back of a pickup. Now we just threw it on the top of the back of the rig. You know, just threw it up there and you yeah. bring it back to quarters. And sometimes there are fifty foot lanes frozen. Yeah. Oh yeah. It wouldn't be uncoupled. You have to fold it over. Once and, you fold yeah. it, you do. You know. The manufacturer will tell you, don't do that. Don't fold the frozen yeah, piece of hose. Know. But you yeah, know what? They're from Florida. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know? Yeah, the 100 foot ladder pipe hose, the LDH, the frozen LDH, you know. SCBA yeah, bottles and, and, and cylinders connected to the SCBA, not getting those yes. unfrozen. That's a pain. Oh, yeah. That's my bottles yeah. out. Oh, man. Your mask fogging I've up. I've seen outside. regulators yeah. freeze. Yep. Yeah, from the, yeah. from the condensation of the firefighter's breath, I've actually seen. We use Scotts, and they've changed the design of it, but actually, where the diaphragm would freeze up, so they would mm-hmm. take it off, you know, yeah. while they're cooling down, change the cylinder, but the mask is hanging at their side while they're changing the cylinder, and it, that would actually freeze up from the condensation of their breath. But they've changed the design a little bit. The, the springs are different, and yeah. you know, hopefully, yeah. that doesn't happen anymore. Well, you know, and the worst thing is, you know, the, the, the sweat, right? You're sweating inside, you come outside, and now Bro. we're setting up ladder pipes, and, you know, that's not a lot of fun. And, and the worst thing is the, the master streams always seem to find the command post. <laughs> <laughs> well, the two and a half so always seem to sweep the command post, you know? Poor that's why planning. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why, you know, like, that, that's the consequence of not being a mobile command, you know, being in a car for a command post, you know. <sighs> you know? Uh, I guess that's one of the consequences, but, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, but they're all in California. They don't have to worry about that. Uh, yeah, that's true. That, but that one is, thing, yeah. it it's going to sound like I'm whining, but I'm really not whining. One of the Whining. difficult things, if you're a command officer, you're not doing anything physical. You know, maybe walking around doing a 360, walking up and down in front of the building. But you're not moving in this weather. And you're talking about your feet and your hands. Um, as I got older, that became a big deal. Like you said, you, your hands burn, you, your toes get cold. The guys, and again, until they get wet, they're at least moving. They're they're stretching hose, they're raising ladders, they're they're out and about. 
at the command post, you're pretty much standing still and you have to also think about things, hand warmers in your pockets, uh, in your in your cold weather bag and the like, because standing still for three or four hours in a defensive fire is it's hard and it's cold. You know, and uh, when you start thawing out, it starts to hurt more. So having hand warmers in your pocket and you can even use the disposable ones, you know, the, the ones in the plastic bags, you break and you shake them up with the salts. They worked really, really well for me anyway. If you're ever looking for those, go to your ambulance and grab those hot packs. I've done that before. If they don't have them, yep. I'll just go get a hot pack off an ambulance, throw them in each one of my pockets and then tell those guys like, hey, when you get back here, I need some hot, be- hot packs. Mm-hmm. Is it, yep. right. I mean, it gets cold standing out there. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. But if your department doesn't have a plan for cold weather firefighting, something written down that, that helps you prepare for everything, mm-hmm. you, you, you need to put that in place. And, and again, a, a good place to do that, a good forum is the ISFSI website where there's a forum there. Hey, does anybody have a cold weather firefighting plan? Yep. Somebody just did that. I sent them the one I had, which I, I thought was – I thought was the was the one I actually wrote, and, and it wasn't. So, but it's, it's it was okay anyway. But you know, it was okay. It wasn't mine. It was okay. <laughs> no, no, no. It was. <laughs> I, I thought I had written a much more comprehensive one. So when I looked at it after I sent it, I was like, "Wow, that don't look familiar." But you know, all these things, and you know what? The article in Fire Engineering, you could probably do a cold weather training, cold weather departmental plan just based on that article of what you need to get done. And, and to be quite honest, all it is is checklists and boxes, checklists and timelines. And that's all you do. We need this by this point, this by this point, you know, day before storm, day of storm, that kind of thing, you know, because we listen, you almost always know when a big storm's coming, you know, you almost always know. So if you have something in place, um, you know, uh, and you can, you know, work your way up to it a couple of days out, day before that kind of thing, before the snowflakes start to fall, you know, you're ready to go. You know, and, uh, you know, and that includes staffing too, you know, they would always hold over the shift that worked the night before, you know, sometimes they hold over the whole shift, you know, of course they let the deputies go, <laughs> but there was, times I remember we had a big storm and they held over everybody and they split the regional in half. So I stayed at 29th street and one of the other deputies, I think went up to like 46th and park or something a little bit further up. And they operated that way. We put four battalions and two deputies in place mm. and, and just split the region, but they put more rigs in place. You know, I think we did that with the hurricane too. Now that I'm thinking about yeah. it. Yeah. I, I was, yeah. I'm positive. We did that with the hurricane. We went to f- two divisions and four battalions and uh, you know, you, you got to expand, you know, you have to, you have to figure that out. If you put more companies on duty, you probably need more chiefs on duty. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I agree. Mm-hmm. One of the things that this is all great, but you have to do it early enough, especially if you get you're expecting a significant snowstorm or a hurricane. I don't know how you guys do with tornadoes out by you, Brian, but you can't wait to. Oh, well, when when the snow gets worse, we'll call in. Now your members, your relief people, can't get there. You know, there's eight inches of snow in the road. Now they have to drive from 20 miles away or 30 miles away to get to the firehouse when there's one or two inches of snow and they're predicting a foot or more, get them in before the snow comes. Because then I remember one time this kid, Lou, who's still a great kid, love him to death. He actually had a shovel, shovel for blocks to get to him and his part. He actually had the guy he works with stay at his house because this guy lived 50 miles away. To get to a main road that was plowed, they had to dig their way there. Mm, that's terrible. And it's like, and so they held people over to for them when they got there. Well, I'm going to leave someone of rank was giving them a hard time that they were so late. They shovel. You should kiss these guys' asses, you know. <laughs> but but anyway, um, they literally blocks they shoveled to get to a main road that was plowed. It got so bad. That was the same storm that the um, National Guard helped out. But it was just like. You can't wait. You got to get them in early. Yeah. And, well, um, you, you know, and you can't go home. <laughs> you know? Oh, no. You can't go home. You can't. There's no, you know, there's nowhere to run to. There's nowhere to hide when it gets really, really cold like that. And, you know, that's that's part of the job. That's yeah. We, the yep. Job. You know, that little ice storm we had uh, last week where that truck went, 
you know, I came in at midnight the night before uh, just because, right? Like I want to make sure I was here, settle in, all those things. And just, you know, because to your point, you know, we, if, if, if something happens and we got to get in, you know, I'm coming from home. I didn't want that delay. We're, you know, we're already sort of delayed anyway, but it's, you know, so those sort of things, you know, if you expect your troops to do things for you and, and the right stuff, then, you know, lead by example, yeah. do the right stuff as well. So, yeah. What do you drive? Do you a Tahoe like vehicle? No, no, he's got me in this like uh, basically like a golf cart type. No, I, I yeah, well, check. that's he's saving, he's got, he's saving the money for the time. Yeah, he, he's, he's actually got a limo that chauffeurs him around with a driver and stuff. But uh, no, no, I got a Chevy Tahoe. So yeah, it's a four wheel drive, which is perfect. You know. Yeah, that's great in the snow. Yeah, did not so great on the ice. No, nothing's good on ice. I don't care what you got. Nope, he got nothing. the Dundee mobile. Unless you got <laughs> chains on it. <laughs> You know, and that's another thing you got to think of, you know. Absolutely. Um, if you don't have chains, no matter what yeah. you're driving, it doesn't work on ice. No, not going anywhere. Right. Right. You, yeah. know, you may, yeah. but you may not stop either. Right. You know, and, uh, you know, it's pretty crazy. But just to summarize my thoughts on this whole conversation, um, pre-plan, take care of the members, take care of the equipment. Um Prepare with your public works department and whoever takes care of your electrical. It makes a big difference when there's a blizzard coming. Um, and we get these nor'easters where I am that are just absolutely insane. You know, 60 mile an hour winds and heavy snow at the same time. Um, it's crazy. And um, we had a chief for a while that was following all the NFPA wind stuff. Well, we can't go out. The winds are too high. Well, you know, we're it you know, limit the amount of people on road, but you got to get somebody out to an emergency. And uh, I understand the rules and the rules are there for safety reasons, but really there's, a, if we can get around, we should be getting around and we should be taking, but we need to watch for trees, wires, um, and people trapped in the snow. Look at Buffalo last year, what yeah. happened there. Yeah. They took an off rig from the airport to pick people up stranded on the highway and bring them back to their firehouses to, to feed them and heat them. They were out there for days. That's crazy. On I-90. Days. Mm. They lost six they lost six rigs, you know, trucks and engines just out on the road. So um you gotta take care of your equipment. And again, please take care of your people. Make sure they know to keep warm. Mm. Very so good. that's that's my thoughts on on that. Um, summarizing your article, Chief. Thanks. Thanks. Well, good. Well, good. So, um, yeah, I, I, are we on in March? I know we're we have FDIC. FDIC. Um, let me look. Are we on in March fourth. Yeah, we're on March eleventh. Is our next show. Really. So yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because we're on right now. We're on. It's February the the first. So it, the way it rolls is we usually do almost every other month. But because of the way it's running, we have uh, we have that show. We, we're on. Uh, you know that'll be our pre FDIC show. Gotcha. Mm. So, Joe, you and I have to get together and you know decide whether we're going to get the FDIC people at that show or do get them at FDIC. I think we'll, we'll talk about that. that. Yeah, yeah, right there, but yeah, 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 we'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk we'll about it. it we're, we're very happy that my, our brother Brian Thank came you. in today, did a great keynote speech last year, by the way, and I'm sure you're glad that all that uh, pressure's off you this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a uh, it was an experience last year. Uh, I'm glad I was able to uh, to do it. Uh, say I did it. It was an incredible experience, but. Uh, this will be a much, uh, much more laid back FDIC for me with not having that pressure come Thursday morning. <laughs> yeah, no, I know it's it's a lot of pressure. It really yeah. is. It really is. Yeah. So, yeah. Wednesday yeah, would have been fun. better. You only have to think about it. One more you night. Get there, you do it the next day. Now yeah, you don't have yeah. the next night to think it's, about it. Exactly. 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 Cool. So any any thoughts that we may have missed on the, the cold weather stuff? I know we just touched on it because there's so much more in the all district or area centered read the article yeah get out there and read that stuff join the isfsi let's talk about it yeah you know what brian always harassed me hey your dues are late he, he always i said you're watching <laughs> my eyes on you guys That's somebody's right. gotta 
I always pay them at the FDIC. Yeah. That's that's how I remember. FDIC yep. pay my fees. Yep, and they're always set up right outside the speaker's room. Yes. All good. What, okay. What's their plan this year, Brian? Same thing, right? Setting up out. It's going to be a, a so we there. Yeah, so we're going to have our booth. We're in the main hallway uh, outside uh, that kind of links up with the uh, JW Marriott and the convention center. So mm-hmm. we're, we're set up out there. Uh, we're right next to fire department coffee. So come get a coffee, come talk to us, um, which is, a you know, we love the location. So we'll be set up Wednesday morning through Saturday. Um, so we'll be in the halls. Of course, a bunch of us will be there uh, throughout all of FDIC uh, from Sunday to Saturday. So um, look for us. We have a we have a new gift this year. We're excited about this. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but uh, for all of our members uh, to be able to come by and pick a little something up uh, that'll only be a members only uh, little gift from uh, ISM side to you. So uh, if you join nice. FDIC, we'll get it to you. But if you're a member in good standing, we'll give you your little little trinket. Oh, cool. There you go. You see a yeah. new president. Now he's bribing us. That's right. There you go. That's right. That's right. Nice. Well, anyway, uh, this is a wonderful conversation. I, I enjoyed it. Can't wait to see you tomorrow, Brian, right? I will see you tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. If you assume you make it up there, your driver is not the best, but hopefully you make it. Uh, <laughs> I I worry more about the flights these days. I'm flying through I'm not the train there gates this year. Oh, you had something else going on. Yeah, it got canceled, so that's all right. Well, Next you, year. Yep. You got to do a real conference. That's what. That's all. You know. You're right. Next so, year. That'd be anyway. Good. Be good to see you. <laughs> Brian, thanks for visiting Chief Villa as usual. It's always good. And you know my closing statement every time we do a show. If you have a chance to buy American, please buy American. We make our salaries on taxpayers' backs. And if you're a volunteer department, you get your donations from taxpayers. If they're not working, they're not paying taxes. And also, it's good to keep our uh, fellow Americans and our brothers and sisters in our neighborhoods working. So if you can't, I know you can't always. I know you can't buy a laptop made in America. You know, you can't, lots of things. But if something's a buck more at the hardware store, you know what, buy the one made in America. You know it's going to work, and you're putting some local people to work. So thank you very much. Until next time, and hopefully we see you all at FDIC. And those of you in middle America, I hope to see you in Missouri this weekend. Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip, the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, Visit magnagrip.com.